Thank you, Pat, and good morning, everyone. Um, we have a really wonderful lineup of uh, speakers and discussion topics for this morning. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, as you can see on your slide uh, in front of you, um, our panelists in this first session will include Mike Jack from NOAA Fisheries, who will talk about sort of the wide diversity of sampling modalities that have some potential for use in offshore wind monitoring or monitoring at offshore wind farms. Um, then we'll hear from Sophie Van Paris, also from NOAA Fisheries, who will talk in more detail about passive acoustic monitoring and its potential application to monitoring at offshore wind farms. And then we'll hear from Kevin Stokesbury, a professor at UMass Dartmouth, um, who will talk about some of the work that he and his colleagues at SMAS have been doing over in the vineyard wind uh, lease area. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let me pass it over to Mike Jack to get us kicked off. Mike, you may, be, you may be muted. That's Mike, let's see. Something. Mike, are you with us? I think Mike just rejoined. I don't know if he's having okay. a connection issue. So let's, um, let's try it one more time and then we'll see what's up. Uh, Mike, are you with us? Yes. Can you hear me now? Now yes. we can hear you. Beautiful. Thank you. Sorry, my, my, my government furnished laptop just two minutes ago decided to kick me off. So I had to run down to my other computer, which doesn't have a video connection, unfortunately, but does have the audio. So you're, you're um, loud. All right, great. So Mike, over to you. Mike, do you have slides? Because if so, maybe Lisa can project those. I don't know. I do have slides, yes, or she has them either way. Okay, and Mike, you, if you want to, if you can project from there, have at it. Just go ahead and project from your computer. Okay. You're a co-host, so we can you can share your screen. There we go, Mike. I can see myself. Okay. Dad, rather see your slides. Um, there they go. Okay. Is that good? That's great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, sorry for the delay. Um, so I would just like to give a, a quick overview of um, what the, some of the sampling modalities, and then I will be getting into more detail on the active remote technologies and the capture technologies and platform technologies and. Sophie will get into more of the passive technologies. So we'll get started. So I just want to give us all a, a, a quick update or a quick uh, a fee, up feeling for what active remote technologies are and how I'm defining those. And so active means that we're transmitting some energy into the water and using the received signal plus noise to infer something about what's in the sampling volume. And you'll see those words are highlighted, and those are very important parts of the remote set and sensing technologies. So the transmit and receive, ideally instruments are calibrated such that the transmit energy and receive electronics are stable over a wide range of environmental conditions. In other words, any detected changes are due to changes in what's being measured rather than changes in the instrument itself. And that's a very important thing I want to emphasize is that people who have developed these sensing instruments have spent a lot of time making sure that they're, they're stable. And the calibrations that we use are calibrated to a standard. So they're a little diff different terminology for our meaning of the cali word calibration than for some of the other uh, things that you may hear also. Noise, there's always some level of noise in the signal. In some cases, it may be lower than your detection threshold, but at some point it will overwhelm your signal and this limits your sampling volume or what you can detect over a certain uh, range. 
The sampling volume is the amount of water, either three dimensions or seabed, two dimensional footprint, or sea surface from satellite images from which you can get usable information. And that directly relates to the scale of your observations, which we'll see in the next slide. And infer, and probably one of the most important things is that all remote, sens remote sensing technologies are an indirect measure of what you really want to measure. And for example, a CTD is a great example. C stands for conductivity, which is electrical signal that is transformed into salinity. Temperature is also measured electronically, and then D stands for depth, but we actually measure pressure, and that's transformed to depth. So that's where the direct sampling, the verification is sampling is extremely critical for remote sensing technologies. The sampling volume is directly related to the scale of the measurement. So that means how far can you detect your target, the range, and the resolution. So how small can your target be and still be detected? In general, Optical sensors, in situ optical sensors have limited range, meters to tens of meters relying on clear water, but they have very high resolution. So you can see very small objects. Acoustic sensors have great range. And in fact, you know, if you, if you produce a sound in one part of the ocean, you can, you, you can often detect those, that sound if it's low enough frequency in the, throughout almost all the global oceans. But the resolution is quite low in that, in that case. And capture gear integrates over large volumes, but provides absolute evidence of presence. Not really absence, but so if you don't catch something in your net, you don't know that it's not there. But if you do catch something in your net or your sampler, you can say that it was there. And the right figure is just simply a, uh, an example of different spatial scales of different uh, types of technologies. So just a couple of couple examples. This is a kind of a, a field of view or the range and the resolution of optical images that we get. In the upper left-hand corner is very short ranges, but very high resolution. And that's the upper left image is an in-situ uh, image of a krill or a little small shrimp using a holographic camera. And that, that actually sends out a laser beam, a column of laser beam. And uh, that's about a few centimeters diameter or about a meter. So your 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 uh, the sampling volume is very, very small, but the images that you get are quite nice, and you can actually see the hairs on the appendages of some of the zooplankton. Then we get to the more medium range and resolution images, which is I think we're most familiar with, which are images of still, still images that are about a meter in size or so. In this case, it has to be scallops. And that's what we get in situ. Uh, if we want to start getting larger with optical images and greater ranges and, and bigger areas, then we need to go aerial. And this is an example of a Menhaden school taken with a, a camera, just a digital camera from a drone. You can see the Menhaden school here and actually striped bass in the middle here. And if we want to go a bit bigger, we, this is a LiDAR image of a, uh, uh, an image of a school. So this is taken from an airplane with a laser detector. And there's an uh, image of a fish school here. So we can get uh, you know, much larger ranges as we go aerial. Um, acoustically, again, we have an upper left-hand corner, short ranges and high resolution. Now, we don't get to quite the resolution that optics does, but in some cases, it's called acoustic, acoustic lens technology, which is um, uh, um, give you high, almost like ultrasound. It is ultrasound, actually, and uh, gives you high-resolution images. And then we get to the more typical echograms that we typically see. Uh, there's some multiple frequency echograms. This happens to be George's Bank on the left. That's a, a shoal of herring on the right in the deeper water, getting ready to spawn up on George's Bank. And on the left is uh, the spectral information. These are broadband images of a krill shoal. And these are the spectral information that we get from the acoustic imagery. So we're getting a lot of different types of information from the acoustics. And then this is kind of the typical scales that we see. This is about five miles horizontally by 300 miles vertical. And on the right-hand side is now we're going into tens of kilometers. And each one of these images was obtained from a, from a signal that was, that was uh, uh, sounded about for a couple seconds. And so you can see this circle. This is the sampling volume of this type of this system. It's called ORS. And... We can get we can sample that entire volume in in a few seconds, whereas it would take us days to to transit through ship and get collect the, the standard echograms. The capture gear very important for us, uh, but it's also remember it's also good to remember that while we do get the verification of the of what we're seeing in the remote signals, it does sample 
a small part of the water column. These these pink lines, there's actually two pink lines. It's a head rope and foot rope with a smaller midwater trawl in the, uh, in the sampling in the mesoplagic zone. So that's what we're actually sampling, physically sampling. So from those, we often try to infer what's in these larger layers. And same thing with the bottom trawl. We have a bottom trawl that's sampling very near the bottom. So we have all this stuff going on in the water column, and that's where we have the bottom trawl sampling. Uh, the platforms, we're, we're getting a lot. We use ship a lot, but now we're starting to get into a lot more different types of platforms. Uh, a lot of them are remote systems. Uh, some are autonomous. Uh, some can stay up for very long. This is a sail drone that can, that's basically powered by the wind and the sun. This is a more, this is another autonomous, semi-autonomous vehicle, but it has diesel electric power. So that the limited range and duration, so on the order of days. And we have aircraft and drones now that we can start to look to deploy the instrumentation and autonomous underwater vehicles that we get. Uh, and lastly, but probably most importantly, is data management. Um, the technology we, we use can collect data 24-7, 365, and we can amass large amounts of data that can be processed, analyzed, and archived, and they need to be accessible and discoverable. A data management scheme needs to be developed very early on. Otherwise, you can have a lot of data sitting in a lot of places in disparate formats that are very difficult to actually use. And really, one of the things I wanted to drive home is that the data and the information needs will select your choices of technology. We don't want the technology driving the questions. We want the questions driving the technology. So that's what I have for now. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Lisa, is Kevin up next? I believe Sophie is up next. Sophie, over to you. Yes, no? Uh, no. You're a little bit quiet. OK, let me see if I can update that. Is that better? I'm on my son's computer he uses for Zoom, so I don't know what happens with that. <laughs> that, yeah, I think that's, that is better, so let's give that a shot. OK, awesome. Thanks, Pat. Thank you. See if I can share my screen. Um, so, can you see that? I can and it's in it's in draft mode. Um, so that like, should be yeah, perfect. You okay. Great. So I'm going to um, talk to you all about passive acoustic technologies following on from Mike's active acoustic technologies. Um, a lot of these technologies are currently being used quite extensively for both monitoring and mitigation um, for marine mammals, um, also in wind farm areas, or, or will be at least um, in the coming future, but I'm going to focus on some of the applications as well for fish. So what is passive acoustic monitoring? Um, it provides this non-invasive and uh, valuable alternative um, to traditional monitoring methods such as fishery service surveys and tagging. One of the main benefits is that you can detect animals at night and in bad weather. Basically, it's impervious to you know whether you can see them or not, and particularly um, the bad weather is um, important um, in this kind of the New England area. Um, it was also really good at doing long-term monitoring um, and reducing field effort and costs in that way. There are limitations, um, kind of similar to what Mike talked about, you, presence only if the animals are not vocalizing or calling, you're not going to hear them, you don't know they're there. Um, for most species as well, it's still quite difficult to determine numbers of individuals that are present. Um, and we have, particularly with fish, a lot of sounds that are still unknown. Um, how can you use passive acoustics? These are a few figures um, to show. This is all from marine mammal data, but conceptually it's similar for fish. Um, on the left, you've got spatial coverage. You can cover very large spatial areas or small areas in as much detail as you want. In the middle, this shows you that you can basically record for multiple years. So get long um, time records and seasonality in certain areas. 
And on the right, this figure shows you the entire frequency range that's available out there. And you can really listen to every single species that's making any sound, um, as well as all the anthropogenic sounds. So the dark um, kind of blackish gray band are vessel noise over and down the bottom you can see the months of the year this is in just one of the areas of george's bank and then below that in the light gray you've got air guns so you can not only see how often these sounds are around you can also see how they overlap with different species such as in this case the um, yellow orange is humpbacks the um, green is say whales the blue is fin whales um, but you know fish are in that lower frequency range as well so the questions we've kind of designed as to when you have to uh, when you're considering using passive acoustic monitoring, these are the six questions you kind of have to ask yourself when you're designing what you're going to be um, and how you're going to be going about things. What are the species of interests? What are your PAM data collection types? What are your recording technologies? What's your design going to be? Um, what are your system requirements? And how are you going to report and archive your PAM data? So what are your species of interest? Um, when you're using passive acoustics, really everything that's making a sound in the ocean is available to you. So in many cases, like I've said before, we use these for ESA listed whales, but obviously there are a number of fish species that make sounds. And then as well as this, you can also track and record and understand the anthropogenic, so the, the sounds that are put into the water in addition to that. What are the different technologies that are available? There's two primary types of technology. There's archival and then there's real time. Archival really means that you put out a recorder, you put it out for days, weeks, months, it can go out for a number of years and then you pull it back out and that's when you get the information. Now archival is primarily these in this orange um, color. So you can see there, there's these bottom mounted recorders. There's different types of recorders you put out and that can go to different depths in different circumstances and record for um, long periods of time. You can also put out acoustic tags on the actual animals. Some like on this whale are passive acoustic recording tags, while others in the blue are telemetry tags and those are the active acoustic tags that actually produce pings and those are the ones that you can you know insert into fish sew them up and they can last for um, several years um, on the right you've got real time that basically means that the information rather than you having to wait to get that information it can come back to you it, almost instantaneously um, and this is all those green circles um, show you the technologies available for those. You've got wave gliders, you've got the, the battery operated slocum gliders, you can have towed arrays towed behind your boat, you can have just a hydrophone off the side of the boat, you can also have these oceanographic drifters with um, recorders on. And, um, and then as well as that, you can have surface buoys that are moored up to the bottom of the ocean, but have a surface expression so it can send back that data in real time. So once you've decided on those things, what's your design going to be? Here, um, primarily what I'm showing you is for whales, but um, I added a little bit of fish information here too. Um, for example, first of all, what you need to understand is your detection range of the sound that they produce. For um, whales, this, in this case, it's a right whale. Um, and it, um, all whales tend to vocalize over quite large distances. Right whales are more constrained than others. So in here we have a 10 kilometer radius um, that we use for right whale detection range. However, for fish, in this case, it's Atlantic cod, it's, it's one kilometer or less. Um, so you need to kind of have that in the back of your mind. Um, in the middle here, you've got a figure that shows you the broad perspective. This is just, um, a sampling design that we've suggested, for example, if you wanted to listen for right whales across the entire Northeast Wind Development Area. Um, of course, that's the broad picture. Then what you really want to do is hone in onto the areas that you're most interested in or that are going to happen, where the activities are going to happen. Um, so these are regional and lease site scales. And here, the top one is actually a study that we have ongoing now that's funded by BOEM. Um, with multiple different partners that are engaged in this and the blue, the, sorry, the purple tracks are gliders that go through that area. And it's just showing you kind of the um, scope over which you would want to listen for fish. And the blue squares are the um, Massachusetts, Rhode Island um, putative um, 
wind energy development areas. Down in the bottom right, you have that same area, but it's how you would design, create a pan design um, to listen for whales. So you can see it's a very different scale that you would be addressing. What are PAM requirements? So both your hardware and your software needs to be able to record over the frequency ranges that the species of interest is um, going to be vocalizing at. In this case with fish, you can see it's down in the lower frequencies, down in you know the, the 10, well, that, I guess it's probably about 80 hertz um, and slightly lower that they'll start and then up to one kilohertz. So down in the low frequency ranges, really those that overlap with a lot of the um, human um, made noises such as air guns, shipping and pile driving, as well as the HIG equipment. Um, once you have hardware and software that's available and able to um, record over those frequencies, you really want to um, make sure that your data evaluation and processing has been done appropriately, that the analysts that you bring on board are experienced and um, and have um, are capable of looking at um, passive acoustic data. And this is just an example of how we evaluate um, passive acoustic data and the efficacy of the automated detectors that we use here on the right. So quick few more examples of archival passive acoustics. This is the data that you have to wait in order to get back. What can this type of data give you? It can give you information on long-term changes, both temporally and spatially. On the left here, this is um, a year in the life of an Atlantic cod. Um, and you can see that what you can get is you can look at Atlantic cod grunts over time. This is the vocalization they produce when they're spawning. So you can delineate the spawning season. You can see when it starts, you can see when it peaks, and then you can see when it peters off. That's what you can use passive acoustics to understand. On the right here, what you have is an amalgamation of both acoustic telemetry as well as passive acoustic data. And what this shows you is that you can actually look at the area over which, so the spatial area over which spawning is occurring over time. Now, just a quick look at what the real-time passive acoustic data can give you. So this is information that you get back instantaneously. That information, as it gets fed back, can um, come to you in a variety of different ways. It can come to you, here on the left, you can see web platforms. These are a number of different platforms we currently use for marine mammal detections. However, Robot for Whales also has some of the fish telemetry detections on there. Um, you can get notifications either by email or text, so you can actually know in real time what's happening and what's going on. And then there's also a bunch of different um, just uh, phone applications. There's a Coast Guard view one as well as um, Whale Alert. Most of these, like I said, are designed for marine mammals, but they can be used equally for the type of um, fisheries information. So there's been a real explosion of need with um, this technology. And here's an example of this one particular study that I was talking about. This is Cox's Ledge. Um, it's kind of covers the South Fork wind energy area. And um, you can see basically this is, the, sorry, the wind energy area, this left-hand side. Like I said before, the purple is an autonomous glider that we um, have go through the area and it contains, it can listen both for the sounds that Atlantic cod and whales make, as well as it has this telemetry um, device on there as well. So it can use, it can listen both for passive as well as active acoustic data as it's going through this area and collecting information. Um, the red obviously shows you the Atlantic cod tags. Just below there is a plot of all the real-time telemetry data that we received from the tags that were put on Atlantic cod this past winter. Um, and we'll be repeating this again this um, upcoming season. And then on the left, what you've got is the actual whale vocalization. So we could see within that glider track when different whale species were present in real time as well. So it can be a really effective tool, both for monitoring as well as for mitigation in these wind energy areas. Um, How do you put it all together? This is just one example. It's a map, a historical map of passive acoustic data that we've developed. This again is um, marine mammals. You can look at different species over different spatial areas over long periods of time. This is actually an amalgamation of 15 years of passive acoustic data. So it starts to build up an understanding of species presence um, and temporal as well as seasonal use. Sophie, it's been about 11 minutes just to let you know. Great, this is my last slide. Thank you, Pat. 
Um, so just like Michael's talking about databasing and visualization, what are you going to do with the information when you collect it? Um, here on the left, the recordings. So we've had to deal with this a lot ourselves as well. Um, passive acoustic recordings can be quite extensive. We actually provide those to NOAA's NCEI who um, database and archive these recordings in perpetuity. I showed you how you can database some of these detections. This is one of the sites, some of the ideas as well as information visualization is going to be another big thing so that you can access the data when you're actually um, out there and, and kind of have that information um, and use it um, effectively. And this is kind of the different options that I've already shown and mentioned. Um, so yeah, these are just the questions that we tend to go through when we're designing um, passive acoustics um, monitoring. Thank you. That's me all done. Thank you, Sophie. Great. Really appreciate the slides. Um, let's see. I think uh, we've got Kevin. Last but not least of our three. Hello. Hi, Kevin. Hi, I'll share my screen here. Let's see, we'll get, Sophie, you're gonna unshare, right? Yeah, I'm just, sorry. Nope, you did. You did. did I do it? Okay, good. I was you're trying right. to figure out how to do it. I know, don't worry. Great. And Kevin, let's see, we're in draft mode and yeah, and then, how's that? Beautiful, perfect. Awesome. And I hope everyone can hear me. Hello, everyone. I, I, I'm seeing all the names on the participants there. I wish uh, we were all able to all get together, see a lot, see a lot of friends. Uh, what I've been asked to talk about is the work that um, I and some of my colleagues have been doing uh, along with uh, Vineyard Wind to start their monitoring. And then I'm going to talk about that and then just kind of expand it into a little more of the work as this is a regional focus. So, so here's a list of the, uh, the people that are presently working on this uh, at SMAS. And the way we started it, we um, started working with Vineyard Wind uh, and the fishing industry, of course, to try and uh, get a plan together that will it won't satisfy everyone, but it will certainly uh, try to start to answer some of the questions of what the impacts of uh, this, these developments are going to be on the marine habitat. So this uh, first effort was led by uh, Dr. Steve Cadron, where he organized, uh, along with uh, Krista Banks from, from uh, Vineyard Wind, they organized a series of fishermen's meetings, and we went around and presented the data that we knew, the background data, and, and what possible things we could develop. So we led these series of workshops and we also had a, a, a number of meetings with the different regulators. From that developed this rec um, plan for recommendation and we recommended these four uh, seasonal surveys, the um, benthic uh, uh, survey, trawl survey, uh, trap survey and plankton, which I'll talk about e each very briefly. And uh, then we also proposed a number of supplemental studies that, that should be done. So just to, to jump right in, this is uh, Dr. He's work. Uh, and what we ended up doing uh, preliminary um, surveys for, uh, for all these different types of surveys and developed a power analysis. And we found that really with the, the logistics and the type of uh, work we were trying to do, we were looking for at least a 25% change in the top or most abundant species. So if we could detect at least a 25% change with our before or after control impact design, uh, that's what we were shooting for. And so Chris Rulahan and, and Pingo, he have gotten this underway. The other important aspect with all these that I'll, I'll mention, it's right here in the methods, is that we wanted to tie it in to the larger surveying efforts. So uh, for example, the, the net and the protocols that are used here are the same as those used by the NEMAP survey uh, run out of the Virginia Institute of Marine Science so that they could um, be compared and contrasted on a, on a larger scale, on a regional scale. <clears throat> so we uh, developed a control after, um, before after control impact design. We uh, tried, one of the real challenges of this area is that uh, there weren't any control areas set out specifically in the leasing. So it's very hard to find uh, appropriate controls. Uh, for, for this study, they, they chose one just to the west there. This is our, our ventless tag um, or ventless trap survey that's run out of my lab. And for this, 
we we had a, a couple of different levels. We, first, we used the aliquot uh, random design, similar to what was uh, done by the um, University of, of Rhode Island over for the Block Island area. And it's also used in the ICs. We are using a ventless trap configuration, which is the same that as the, the state of Massachusetts and state of Rhode Island are using, uh, and, and also Maine. Uh, so three vented traps, three ventless traps. And then at, at the request of the Division of Marine Fisheries in Massachusetts, we also put a, put a black, sea, um, black sea bass pot on the end of each one. So this is done uh, twice a month, starting uh, in April or, or, or May, depending on how soon we can get out there. It's done cooperatively with the Massachusetts Fishermen's, uh, Lobster Fishermen's Association with uh, Beth um, uh, uh, organizing that. And we go out, we, we set a plankton net, and that net was designed by uh, Bob Miller up in, in Canada for some of their larval lobster work. Uh, so we do a larval tow that collects the larval lobster and ichthyoplankton. And then uh, three days later, we set the traps and three days later we haul them and we keep track. And this is the, our first master student, Alex uh, Zygmunt's uh, thesis was just successfully defended uh, on this data set. So you can see again, the impact area and the control in, in blue. We run, uh, Along with that, we also run our drop camera survey, and we do that twice, uh, once in the in the spring, or once in the summer, pardon me, and once in the fall. And this drop camera uh, procedure is linked into our larger scallop monitoring. So this has gone on since 1999, and it covers areas from Virginia all the way up to uh, the Canadian uh, U.S. Hague line, and actually even, even farther into Canada now. So it gives us a, a, a still image, uh, similar to some of the stuff Mike was describing earlier about the, um, the, uh, the image on the sea floor. We actually try and identify 50 different animals and also the substrat. And again, in a, a control uh, impact design. Those are the, the, the main uh, efforts going on right within the vineyard wind area. And then to expand this, uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Chen, uh, who has the FECOM model, uh, many of you will be familiar with this. This is a very powerful oceanographic model. And he received funds from the Scallop RSA program to look at the effects, the possible effects that a wind farm uh, building here off Massachusetts might have on the Scallop larval uh, larval distribution. Of course, this can also, and, and some of his previous students, along with Jeff Coles, they've worked on, on lobster larval distribution as well with this model, and uh, fish distribution. So it's a very powerful tool for fisheries, and that study is underway as well. Dr. Cadron's work, uh, he and his students are doing telemetry work on Cox's Ledge. Uh, their funding sources are, are listed below there, but they're looking at that spawning aggregation and trying to determine a site fidelity and, uh, <clears throat> and how important that area is. And then uh, Dr. Gavin Fay's work. Uh, Gavin's looking at the ecosystem-based management approach, he and his students. And so they're trying to take this uh, into a a larger level incorporating uh, some of the social science as well and looking um, at the impacts. This is from a, uh, there's a recent paper that they've just had out trying to understand uh, how these two industries uh, are going to interact and affect each other and what the effect on society is going to be. And with that, it's very quick. One of the one of the I, I ended it with uh, this shot of a squid mop and and a squid because of course the squid are one of the challenging uh, species to work on and one that I, you know there's lots of areas that we still need to focus on the squid fishery. I think is certainly one of them. But uh, with that, I'll I'll finish off. Pat, thank you very much. Great, thank you, Kevin, and thank you all three. Really appreciate it. So we've got some great questions in Mentimeter. We're probably not going to get to them all. We'll open the chat now to add some, but we, we may not get to those just because of the great sheer number in Mentimeter. 
But let me um, have begin. I think, Sophie, this goes first to you. There are some questions about really how well can these acoustic technologies identify species, uh, fish to the species level? Which particular fish can you actually detect with acoustics? Um, you know, can you say a little bit about that if you could? And Sophie, you'll just need to go off mute. Oh, she can't go off mute. Uh oh. Okay. Uh, let me let me go to another question. Uh, Maggie, can you help Sophie to see if we can get her off mute? Yep, she should be able to now. Oh, I okay. Am now. Yeah. Sorry, it was just the host wouldn't let me go off mute. So. <laughs> All right. I don't know what well, you're, you're you're back on. Go for it. Okay. Great. Yeah. In terms of fish species, um, there's a number of coniferous species that are are well known to produce sounds, and those are They're really easy to identify, like Atlantic cod, haddock, um, a whole bunch of groupers, black drum, and such like. And then there's a number of species of sounds that are out there that we don't yet um, know who produces them. It's just an active field of trying to figure out what's what. So it really kind of depends on what species you're targeting and what you're looking for in the area, as to how you can use PAM. Is there any is there, species that you can actually detect, whether that's clams, scallops, maybe even lobsters, or, or not? Um, no, not clams or scallops don't tend to produce sounds. I mean, lobsters may do. Um, you can definitely um, certain invertebrates. You can definitely identify. Um, lobsters have certain sounds, but I don't think that they're not as easy to identify specifically to species. Same thing with sea urchins; they also produce sounds. It's mainly the um, fish species that you're going to be able to identify using this technology. Great. And as you, 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 you know, you showed that one slide about cod and is it did that these species are mostly make noise just during certain times of the year or are they more consistent like whales say across an entire year? They tend to primarily use these sounds um, during the spawning period. They will use them kind of sporadically during aggressive encounters or others um, throughout the year, but you can really kind of use it primarily to, to identify spawning aggregations and kind of major kind of spawning activity. Right, thank you. Uh, the next question, which is really to all three, is when you think about the best technologies for sampling in and around and very close to the turbine structures, what technologies do you think work better for you know, kind of working with what will be a changing environment in terms of the turbines themselves. This is Mike. Can you hear me? Yep, Mike, you sound great. Yeah, I think uh, you know optics are certainly going to be one of your 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 uh, better technologies for close to the turbines, and some of the higher frequency ultrasound types of acoustics can give you better ranges, um, especially if you're worried about turbidity. Sometimes the optics can will be affected, well, certainly they are affected by turbidity, which the acoustics aren't as much. Uh, but there's also, you know, just not cameras, but there's laser types of technologies that give you more range. Um, so there's, uh, but the optics is, is probably one of the better things for right near the, right near the turbines that you have. Great, thanks. Any other panelists want to kind of comment on that question? I'm, I'm um, curious, oops, sorry, go ahead. Sophie, go ahead. Sure. Um, yeah, no, I was going to say, I mean, I think passive acoustics would work as well. It's going to depend on the actual noise produced by the turbines around there and, and just, again, the, the target species. Great. So. And Kevin, when you designed your, you know, your, your study, I assume that the methods you're using were designed to be able to measure before and after the turbines were in place. Is that correct? Uh, that's right. That's right. Uh, certainly the, the drop camera work, the ventless trap work. I mean, there's a, a question about how much you're going to be able to tow in those areas, certainly. And, and uh, you know, we're hopeful that the, uh, the ground fish survey work will be able to be continued as well. However, um, you know, I, I think as, as, as Mike and Sophie have pointed out, uh, uh, there, there are these other techniques that we might have to employ. I think that it's going to be challenging, especially given the um, this spread between the, uh, the the areas one nautical mile in, in those conditions is not a lot to, to tow anything out there. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, which is, you know, and this is maybe Sophie to you, is you, given that there'll be a lot of structure in the water, there is a chance to actually use that structure as a monitoring, you know, stanchion for lack of better terms. So can the turbines themselves be used in some fashion to help with acoustic monitoring? Um, very likely. I mean, I, I don't actually know enough about, you know, what the structures look like. Um, 
underwater and, and how much um, sound they were produced, but you could probably isolate that anyway. Yeah, that, that'd be great. It'd be a great um, option to at least look into that. Okay. Um, there is a specific question, I think, for wreck fishing, but there's a sampling methods have generally not included rod and reel surveys, yet this is a primary method to wreck, uh, wreck fishermen folks, um, you know, catch fish. Uh, why have there not been more rod and reel studies done generally? Um, I can just speak to the study of um, Cox's Ledge, which actually does include rod and reel. Um, I didn't mention it in this case simply because it was meant to be about technologies, new technologies. Um, but we combining active telemetry, passive acoustics, as well as um, rod and reel kind of sampling. Okay. Um, I also believe that Steve Cadron's work, they use rod and reel to collect their, their fish for tagging it with the acoustics. So they're, they're yeah. doing some monitoring with that as well. Yeah, that's Steve's work, the rod and reel. Uh, Kevin, there was a follow-up, which is so the trawl survey may not be able to continue its current sampling method and design once turbines are in place. And Kevin, that was a question to your earlier comment. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that on a, on a, on a six nautical mile setting on your radar screen, you're going to have 121 targets out there, plus, uh, plus fixed gear, plus um, weather conditions. And so how much anyone's going to be able to operate in these areas is still somewhat of a question. We had to go with the, the best that we could. And I think Dr. He and, uh, Chris Rulahan and, and Vineyard Wind as well uh, accepted that. And I, I think that as a, you know, with the scientific gear, um, if it's set up properly and on a straight line, and, and also the fact that we can, we can time the weather, we're hoping to be able to sample. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of unknowns, the insurance companies, for example, and we all our work is collaborative with fishing industry, the fishing industry. And so the limitations that are on the fishing industry are, are probably also going to be on us. And uh, I know uh, that this is also a concern with the, the federal vessels. So um, right now, I think we have a, a good structure that it, you know, if, if it is possible, we'll be able to do it. But, you know, if, if you're asking me 100%, will they be able to sample in there? My own opinion is uh, that still remains to be seen once these are built. Thanks, Kevin. I want to get a squeeze a few more in here before we wrap. So, Sophie, there was a question about, you know, in, with existing acoustic monitoring you're doing, are you picking up any of the kind of uh, sounds around the developer G and G surveys, and have you been able to then have seen any response from animals to the G and G surveys? If in fact you can pick those things up, um, we can definitely pick them up. Um, I have to say we haven't actually looked at um, that in any detail yet. Um, since we've been just focusing on um, looking for spawning aggregations, um, we'd have to um, look at that more closely. Um, it's difficult to see, um, you know, responses. First of all, what you really need is a good baseline um, as to what an where, where animals are and how they behave, you know, in the absence of those sounds as opposed to when those sounds are around. And frequently we don't actually have that baseline to kind of put into context. Um, which is one of the big issues. Um, but I think, you know, we can definitely hear them and it's, it's, it's definitely something that could be looked at. Right, so we, um, there may be some data to mine, so to speak, that actually exists today. Yes. Great. Um, question, I think there's a few questions related to this, but kind of how do we make sure we're getting fishermen into some of these studies to really draw on their knowledge, you know, on the sea day to day about how species might be behaving and then tie that into the research design or the methods? You know, how do we involve cooperative research in all of this? I don't know if folks could kind of speak to that question for a bit. Well, I can jump in there with it. So all our, our work is, I mean, as I said, we, we had these meetings, Steve led those meetings uh, to start with, but all our work is on, on fishery, uh, uh, fishing vessels. So we're working with the, uh, the captains, either the lobster fishermen or the, the trawl fishermen uh, directly. Uh, and, um, in our case, they're part of the design as well. We, you know, we bring them right in and, and work with them right the, the way through as we do with, with all our cooperative work. Other, other comments on kind of involving fishermen? I think the, the, the commercial industry is, is going to be very important to, to getting into these wind farms when, you know, there's, they have more resources uh, in terms of, you know, the availability of, of the vessels than, than some of the 
other lab state and federal laboratories. And so I think, um, you know, they have the capabilities, they have knowledge, is a knowledge of the areas where they are. The captains have knowledge, have knowledge of the areas. So I think they'll be very important to, to if, you know, deploying either technology or, you know, um, getting to, to different uh, remote places from the wind farms. Yeah, I can actually add on to that. I have to say during this, um, you know, pandemic, we've been using commercial fishermen extensively to help us with our technology to get it out there. Um, and I, again, just, you know, like Kevin said, you know, S Steve Cadron is, is the person doing a lot of the fishery sampling um, on the Cox's Ledge project and similarly is using, you know, fishermen for that. Um, yeah, so definitely of, of great value and, and awesome resource to be able to get things out. Great. Um, we have a few more questions I'm not going to be able to get to. All of these get recorded in the meeting summary and get passed back to the study authors to make sure they're thinking about them as they proceed with the work. Um, so the um, there is a question um, in the chat. I'll just share with the researchers in a bit as well. So thank you, panelists, very much. Great presentation, really interesting. And we'll probably be thinking about these tools as we actually talk and work through the day. Um, and thank you, Lisa, so much. So terrific. Um, we're going to jump to our next one, and our next topic is really cumulative impacts. Uh, and Lisa, I'm going to turn this maybe to you to just introduce briefly. What we'll do is we'll close the Mintimeter for this topic and then reopen it for the next. And again, all these things get saved in the meeting summary. So Lisa, over to you. Thank you, Pat. Um, I'm